Hey everybody. Today I'd like to talk to you about magnetic moments and torque on current loops. So this all comes from the magnetic force on a current carrying conductor in a magnetic field. So let's say that you have a current I um, in a constant magnetic field B, okay? Then we have shown in a previous lecture that there's a force on that current carrying wire that's placed in the magnetic field. Um, and that the direction of that force is given by the right-hand rule according to the equation F is equal to IL cross B, where I is the magnitude of the current in, um, passing through the wire, L is the vector that points in the direction of the current that contains the magnitude of the length of the wire segment, and B is, of course, the magnetic field. So let's talk about how that can create a torque on a current loop. So to do that, let's look at this picture here on the right. Um, and let's assume that we have a magnetic field to the right, shown by the green arrows here. And immersed in that magnetic field, you have this square current loop, okay? Now, the current in this loop is flowing counterclockwise, as you can see from the purple arrows indicating the direction of current flow. And the dimensions of the loop, this rectangular loop, are A and B, as shown here, little a and little b, okay? Now, let's talk about the force on each one of those four segments of wire that make up the loop. Okay, they're marked here 1, 2, 3, and 4. To discuss 1 and 3 first, you can see that in segment 1 and in segment 3, the current in the wire runs anti-parallel and parallel to the magnetic field respectively. So that would make the angle in between um, L and B 180 degrees or 0 degrees. Now, as you know from a cross product, the sine of theta is what it's proportional to, and the sine of 0 degrees and 180 degrees is 0. So that means that there's no force on segment 1 and segment 3 of that wire because they run in either parallel or anti-parallel to the field. However, the same can't be said of segments 2 and 4. In that case, the current runs um, down through segment 2 and up through segment 4. And that's at 90 degrees to the field, okay? So you can see that in segment 2, for example, if we apply the right-hand rule, IL cross B would give a force um, on segment 2 that's out of the screen here. And then if you look at segment 4, um, IL cross B would be into the screen, as you can see here. So there is a force on segment 2 and segment 4, okay? Now, the magnitude of this force would be the magnitude of the current I times the length of the wire segment A times the magnitude of the field B. So it would be IAB, and then as I said, theta is 90 degrees, and so the value of sine of theta would be 1, okay? So the force there are equal, but they're opposite in direction. Now, because the forces are equal but opposite in direction, then that means that the net force on the center of mass of that current loop is zero. There's no net force. So the loop will not translate, its center of mass will not translate in any particular direction. But it will cause a torque on the loop because here, as you can see, this is the side view now of your loop, and the dots and the x's indicate the direction of the current in that segment. So you can see that we have F2 pointing now up and F4 pointing down in this picture. And so if you mark the center of mass of your loop here, what would happen is that those forces would um, create a torque, okay, on the loop. And the torques would be in the same direction or both. Remember that torque is equal to R cross F. R is the vector that points from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. For F2, R would point to the left. And so R cross F would be into the screen here. For F4, R would point to the right, and so R cross F yet again would be into the screen. So you can see that these torques are in the same direction, and so they work together to rotate the loop. All right? So these things rotate the loop. Now, you can find the maximum torque. The maximum torque would be when the plane of the loop um, is uh, the area vector to the plane of the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field, or the plane in the loop, plane of the loop here, symbolized by the orange, is pointing the same direction of the field. Okay, so that would give you your maximum torque, right? And then R and F would be at 90 degrees with respect to one another um, in, in this picture. 
And that maximum torque would be the sum of the torques from uh, segment 2 and segment 4. And so you'd add them together, remembering that the formula for torque is RF sine of theta, and that sine of theta here is 90 degrees. The distance from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force for our little rectangular loop would be B over 2, okay? So you'd have F2 times B over 2 plus F4 times B over 2. And then F2 and F4, as previously stated, are IAB. So you would have IA, big B, magnetic field, times little b over 2 plus IA, big B, times little b over 2. Those would sum together to be I, little a, little b, times big B. Now, little a times little b would be the area enclosed by the loop, by the rectangle, right? Length times width. And so that means that your maximum torque would be the current flowing through the loop times the area enclosed by that loop times the magnetic field. So that gives you your max torque for this situation. Now, like I said, this maximum value occurs only when the field is parallel to the plane of the loop. Now, what would happen if it weren't parallel to the plane of the loop? Okay, so what would happen if it were at some arbitrary angle, say theta? Let's define a vector we call A, our area vector A, and it's going to point perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Okay, and the magnitude of that area vector would be the area of our loop. So here, A, that area vector, makes an angle theta with respect to the magnetic field. Okay, in that case, as you can see, what would happen, we have our R vector here pointing from the uh, axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. That R vector makes an angle theta with the forces, F2 and F4. So here, what would happen is that your torque would be I times the area vector magnitude times the magnetic field times the sine of the angle theta. So if you tilt it, right, then your torque uh, has that sine of theta proportionality in there. So it's at its max value when the field is perpendicular to the normal of the plane of the loop. The torque is zero when the field is parallel to the normal with the plane of the loop. And the torque in general would be IA cross B, because as we showed here, the torque is IAB sine of theta. So whenever you have that sine of theta dependence, that's your cross product. So here, torque is the current times the area vector crossed with the magnetic field, okay? Now, to figure out what direction the area vector points, what you would do for a current loop is you would take your right hand you would curl it in the direction that the current flows within the loop, and then your thumb would be the direction of the area vector. And so that's how you would have a right-handed A, okay? Now, we call this current times the area vector the magnetic dipole moment, often symbolized with either, depending on the textbook, the Greek letter mu or an M, okay, depending on the textbook. So this is the magnetic dipole moment. I'm going to go with mu of the loop. And we often call this the magnetic moment. So that's the current times the area vector. So I had SI units of amps times meters squared, of course. Now, if you write the torque in terms of the magnetic moment, the torque would be equal to mu cross B, okay? So this is similar to saying that when you place a current loop in a magnetic field, you pass the current through the loop, right? What's going to happen is it's going to have a magnetic moment that magnetic moment mu will cause the current loop to rotate. There's a torque exerted that causes the current loop to rotate to align with the field. And this is very similar in idea to the uh, magnetic dipole or the electric dipole moment that we covered, right? So if you place a, a an electric dipole in an electric field, then the electric dipole moment right, will have this torque on it. Torque is equal to P cross E, and the dipole moment will rotate to align with the electric field, okay? So these are very similar ideas. Now there's also a potential energy of this system for a magnetic dipole in a magnetic field. So in other words, if the magnetic dipole moment is aligned with the field, then that's a low energy situation. But if the magnetic dipole moment is at some angle with respect to the field, right, at any angle other than zero with respect to the field, right, then you're going to have a higher energy situation. So we write this as a dot product. So the potential energy of a magnetic dipole 
in a magnetic field, u is equal to minus mu dot b, where mu and b undergo the dot product. This would make the minimum possible energy minus mu b, and that would occur when the dipole moment was in the same direction of the field. And then plus mu b would be the maximum, and that's when the dipole moment is anti-parallel to the field. Okay? All right, let's do an example problem here. And in this example problem, we've got a glass cylinder, and it's got a radius r, length l, and a density rho. And it has a 10-turn coil of wire wrapped lengthwise around it, as is shown in the picture. So you can see here the coil of wire is wrapped such that it makes a rectangle within this field. Okay, looking down on it, it makes a rectangle. Okay, so we have a uniform magnetic field B that points straight upwards. So for what loop current will the cylinder rest on the ramp in static equilibrium? We can assume that static friction is large enough to keep the cylinder from simply sliding down the ramp without rotating. All right, so let's work this through this example problem together. I include the original picture here on the top right for comparison purposes, and then I do my little kind of diagram of all the forces and, and things acting on it, vectors acting on it here, side view, okay? So if you look at this, there's going to be two torques on this cylinder. Those two torques are caused by the magnetic dipole moment mu, right, uh, and the magnetic field there. So there's going to be that mu cross B, as we've been discussing. But then there'll also be another torque, and that torque is due to static friction acting at the point of contact in between the cylinder and the ramp. Now, um, in both these cases, the uh, axis of rotation will be the center line of our cylinder, the long axis of the cylinder, okay? So um, what we've got is if we want the cylinder to remain stationary, as is specified in the problem, those torques have to be equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, and then it won't rotate, right, and roll down the uh, ramp. It was also specified that static friction is large enough to keep it from sliding down the ramp for true equilibrium, okay? So, what we've got to have is those torques equal, as we said. So, what are those two torques? Well, the magnetic field points straight up, and so as you can see here, the magnetic moment is going to be perpendicular to the plane of the loop. So, the plane of the loop as drawn here um, for maximum torque would be when the plane of the loop is aligned with the ramp. So I haven't got it drawn in this side view here, but picture the plane of the loop are aligned with the ramp there. And that would make mu point at an angle theta to the vertical. So our torque for the magnetic moment would be mu b sine of theta. Okay. So now that can be written as, okay, now here we've not just got one loop, but it's wrapped 10 times. Okay. So we're going to say n, which is the number of turns, the number of times it's wrapped around, n times the current passing through each loop i, times the area enclosed by that loop big A, times the magnetic field B times sine of theta. Now, what is the area enclosed by that loop? Well, it's a rectangle, and the uh, width of the rectangle would be twice the radius of our cylinder, and the length would be little l here. Okay, so 10i times 2r times l times b times sine of theta. So that's the torque due to the magnetic field. So what would be the torque due to static friction? Well, static friction here is acting up the ramp, okay, to keep it from slipping down the ramp. Okay, so static friction acts up. And then the um, r vector would be r cross f sub s, right? And r here would be the radius of the, um, of the cylinder, okay? So it would be r times f sub s times the angle in between r and f sub s. But since the um, point of contact of the ramp here is tangent to the circle, that's 90 degrees. So the torque in between r and f sub s is uh, r times f sub s because that sign is 1, okay? So we have r f sub s. So all this stuff with the magnetic field, torque, is equal to r times f sub s. So now if I solve for the current with what I've got here, just rearranging these last two bits in the equation, I would get, with a little algebra, I is equal to Rf sub s divided by 10 times 2r times L times B times sine of theta. Now you can see that one of the r's cancels out top and bottom, and I end up with F sub s over 
20 LB sine of theta, okay? But I'm not quite done. There's more than I can say about this, okay? The problem actually states that the force of static friction is large enough to prevent slippage, okay? So what that means is that if you look at this point of contact on the ramp, it's not slipping down, which means that the force of gravity acting on the cylinder down the ramp is equal and opposite to the force of static friction acting up the ramp at that point of contact, okay? So what we've got there is that we can say that the force of static friction is equal to mg sine of theta, okay? Okay, so f sub f is equal to mg sine of theta. Now, um, the mass isn't given, but the density of the material is, so that would be then equal to, uh, the mass would be equal to the density times the volume. And so you have the density rho times the volume, which would be the area of the base, which is pi r squared, times the length of the cylinder L. So you have rho pi r squared L g sine of theta. So if we plug that in for um, F sub s and then sub it back into the equation for current from the previous page, the current would be equal to rho pi r squared L g sine of theta over 20 L b sine of theta. So the sines of theta cancel out on the top and the bottom, as does the L, so the L cancels out, and then you end up with rho pi r squared g over 20b for the uh, current, okay? So that's how you solve that problem. All right, well, um, I hope uh, you understood that, and it was relatively straightforward, and I'll see you in class.